Thank you, Sandy, and thank you to all of you for being here to think about measurement issues with me. We're going to start by thinking of measurement issues in a more general context, and then, like Sandy said, we're going to dive into longitudinal measurement issues. Here is the first article I was assigned to read in my first statistics class. Stevens 1946 defines measurement as the assignment of numerals to objects or events according to rules. The key word here is assignment. Who decides on these rules? How do we decide on these rules? Do we all agree on these rules? Are these universally adopted rules? Are they cross-culturally applicable? Do they withstand generations in a way that allows measurement to be comparable across time? Let's start by talking about what I call unambiguous forms of measurement. Unambiguous measurement involves predefined units of measurement for which we have standard measurement in ex instruments. These are things like height, weight, temperature, and these are things that can be directly observed and directly measured. So I can see how tall this book is, and I can measure it directly and unambiguously using a ruler. Other unambiguous forms of measurement involve things with a yes-no answer or a clear-cut amount. With the number of registered voters in a district, someone is either registered or they're not. I consider these to be unambiguous forms of measurement because assuming that the measurement instrument is being used properly and is in proper working order, anyone doing the measurement should come to an identical conclusion. And even if we don't agree on a metric, it's still unambiguous in that it'll translate to the same conclusion. We can easily shift from inches to centimeters without losing any information. Who here is a fan of the play Rent? The song Seasons of Love is a discussion of measurement issues. They're trying to figure out how to measure a year. The song points out that you can measure a year in 525,600 minutes. Barring leap years, that is an unambiguous set unit of measurement. Other relatively straightforward ways to measure the passage of time that the song suggests inc include in daylights, in sunsets, in midnights, in cups of coffee. However, this is not how the song ends. In determining how to measure a year, the closing lyrics suggest, how about love? Rent says to measure your life in love. Well, how do you measure love? Sorry, Rent. It's going to be difficult to measure your life in love if we're not sure how to measure love. Which brings us to a major issue in quantitative social research. Quantitative research involves studying quantities, and studying quantities implies that we can assign a metric but no natural metric exists for many social science constructs. Often when studying attitudes, behaviors, or skills, we work with what are known as latent constructs. They are latent in that they cannot be observed directly. Love does not tangibly present itself in a way that can be measured with a ruler or a thermometer. We can't see its magnitude the way we can with an object, which means that we cannot assess its magnitude the way we can with an object. Rather, researchers need to figure out how to capture it with indicators once they've defined and operationalized what it is they're trying to measure. Raise your hand if you study people. Take a moment to think about your research. And raise your hand if you study a latent, a latent construct or consume research involving a latent construct. If there's no uniform, unambiguous definition of how to measure it, I would classify it as a latent construct. It's not just love that can't be measured with a ruler. Here is actually a very limited list of examples of latent constructs just to give you an idea. Take a moment to look at these examples. These are just some examples of the many constructs that are studied in social, behavioral, and political science for which there's no direct measure. And by direct measure, I mean that it's not possible to access it directly by placing it on a scale and retrieving a precise number or putting a thermometer in it and getting a precise read. From the outside looking in, it's easy to assume that things are relatively easy to measure, but measurement issues are prevalent in the social and political sciences. I purposely have similar seeming constructs up here under feelings to allude to measurement issues with overlapping constructs and what this means for cross-study comparisons. For example, studying happiness versus bliss. Happiness and bliss are not the same thing, but could easily be conflated if a researcher measures one but refers to it as the other. 
that's outside the scope of this presentation, but if anyone wants to talk about positive emotionality measurement issues, you're invited to my office hours. Measuring democracy is a good example in political science of something that's not straightforward to measure. When we see this need to work, to come to a consensus for how to develop a scale, it's because it's a latent construct. It's something ambiguous to measure. Some other political science examples include war and conflict. How do researchers rank different levels of hostility? In the words of a political scientist who happens to be a TA here at ICPSR, with democracy, war, and conflict, his exact words were, experts in armchairs got together for how we understand these things. There's no way to measure them outright. A major measurement issue is that measuring what you think you are measuring is easier said than done. When I was working on my master's thesis, I tried to study gender ideology, but then I realized it wasn't actually what had been measured. The qu items on the questionnaire didn't tap the construct the way I hoped they did. Who here has tried to test a strong theory-grounded hypothesis and then you were just shocked by the lack of results? It could be because nothing's there. But another possibility is that if you weren't really measuring what you intended to, then you weren't actually testing your hypothesis. In my case, since the variables did not capture what I thought they did, I wasn't addressing the research questions I thought I was. We now return to the quote that I had lingering on my opening slide because I wanted you to mull over it while waiting for my talk to start. Patrick Hearn is one of my favorite methodologists and not because he just so elegantly captures in one sentence why measurement is so important. Take a moment to read this beautiful sentence and think about what it means. The most complex and rigorous statistical models are constrained by the extent to which we are truly measuring what we believe we are measuring. Essentially, with statistical models, we assume that we're measuring what's intended. Otherwise, we aren't studying what we think we are. And if we aren't studying what we think we are, we aren't addressing our research questions. And if we aren't addressing our research questions, then our fancy statistical models might be meaningless. Or put more kindly, cannot give us the insight that we were hoping for. As researchers, it's really important to take measurement seriously when working with latent constructs. The validity of our research conclusions hinges on the assumption that we're studying what we think we are. An unwritten assumption of statistical modeling is that our variables capture what we intend to study. Otherwise, we can't be confident that we're really addressing our research questions. Since my substantive area is child development, my clearest examples are about children, I'm about to show you an example of a study relying almost exclusively on latent constructs that's in early childhood research quarterly. However, these measurement issues have broader relevance. They apply to anything for which there's no inherent metric. Who here has heard of the ANES data set? Later, I'll discuss an example from there too to demonstrate how this is just as relevant in other fields. Here's an example from my work in which all of the variables of interest and most of the control variables have no natural metric. This study uses secondary data from the NICHD study of early child care and youth development. The measurement issues that I'll discuss are relevant to both data collection and to secondary data analysis in that if you have the opportunity to collect data, think hard about these types of measurement issues. And if you work with secondary data, do everything in your power to investigate and understand how everything was measured. This study focused on the interaction of exuberance and effortful control. Exuberance and effortful control are temperament dimensions. You cannot assess temperament with a ruler or a thermometer. Researchers needed to operationalize the construct and develop instruments. Anytime there's no uniform operating definition and we need to figure out how to measure it, then we know it's a latent construct. Let's look at some of my control variables. The income to needs ratio was calculated by dividing total family income by the family's poverty threshold. Income is in dollars, but how do we operationalize what constitutes a need? There's no uniform operating definition. This variable was handed to me wrapped with a bow around it. I was still a child when people thought really hard about how to measure it and computed the variable. That's one of the nice things about working with the secondary data set. I didn't have to do any of the computations. It was handed to me clean and ready to go, but that didn't excuse me from taking the time to think through how it was measured. 
The gift of secondary data comes with the responsibility to get to know it and to make sure you understand and agree with how everything was measured. Quality of the home environment certainly cannot be measured with a ruler. Researchers had to operationalize what constitutes quality and develop an instrument. Maternal education is in years at first. Then there is a coding system where 19 equals law degree, 21 equals more than one master's degree or a doctoral degree. I don't agree with lumping those together into one category and assigning a number and judging by some of your facial expressions, neither do you. Anytime there's room to say, I don't agree with how this is measured, it's indicative that it's not a clear cut form of measurement. Maternal vocabulary also involves a construct for which there's no clear cut way to assign a scale. The outcome variables are also latent construct. It takes teams of psychometricians and content experts to develop a reading or math assessment that we hope captures the construct well. The only variables in my study with natural metrics are maternal age measured in years and child birth order. So my variables of interest and most of my control variables are all latent constructs with no natural metric. The only two variables that arguably come without measurement issues are two control variables. And if I'm being honest here, these two variables were not included in the analysis prior to the peer review process. I say that maternal age and child birth order arguably come without measurement issues because even with unambiguous forms of measurement, we still risk measurement error. The data could have been entered wrong or reported wrong. Someone could have forgotten how old she is or what order her children are born in. Let's think more about the variable that's the star of this article. How do we measure exuberance? Step one of the measurement process involves developing an operating definition. That alone is a process. We're going to skip that step and assume that we've already agreed that exuberance is manifested by enthusiastic positive expression. Now that we've agreed on what it is, how do we measure that? How do we capture enthusiastic positive expression? There's no consensus. We can't measure in inches or use a thermometer. One way to measure it is how excited a child gets when looking forward to something. In the journal article I just showed you, exuberance is defined as positive anticipation and excitement regarding situations of future pleasure. Here are some details about the instrument used to measure this latent construct. Since it has no natural metric, it was assigned one based on how much mom thought each item applied to her child. This questionnaire does a good job at tapping the intended construct, though keep in mind that it's appropriate for measuring exuberance in early childhood. But what if we want to measure exuberance longitudinally and to measure something else longitudinally along with it? A hypothetical research question might be, what is the longitudinal association between exuberance and reading achievement from age four to age 15? How do exuberance and reading achievement travel together across time? To address that research question, we need repeated measures of both exuberance and reading achievement from age four to age 15. Okay, so we already have our exuberance questionnaire, right? By repeated measures, I mean measures which tap the construct equally at each measurement occasion, which brings us to longitudinal measurement issues. Everything I said until now was to first establish that there are measurement issues at any given measurement occasion. Now I'll introduce you to the idea that there are additional complexities on top of that once we go longitudinal. Here's the full set of items for exuberance. Some of these items may still work, but overall we can't expect to use this as a repeated measure from age four to age 15. Take a moment to look at the items and see if any jump out at you as not developmentally appropriate for a 15-year-old. I flagged in red one item in particular which would function progressively worse over time. Typically, developing teenagers don't get excited about a toy the way they did when they were in preschool. So we have here an appropriate measure for childlike enthusiasm, but high exuberance won't manifest the same way across the lifespan. 
I've never seen exuberance measured repeatedly across childhood. So if this were a full semester class, now's when I would have small groups work together to think through this measurement issue and propose solutions. This half of the room would think about how to make the best use of hypothetical secondary data that uses these items to measure exuberance from age four to age 15. Secondary data is a wonderful gift, especially when it's longitudinal. So we want to figure out how to make adjustments so the measures function better over time. The rest of you would get to design a dream study that's intended to assess exuberance longitudinally. Then the groups would share. This exercise would be thought provoking on its own, but it would just be a warm up for what's coming next, which is the rest of the research question. We also need repeated measures of reading achievement. Because our research question is, how do exuberance and reading achievement travel together across time? We'd address this with a fun growth curve model. Growth curve models are longitudinal models that are useful for looking at how people develop and what predicts their growth. But remember Patrick Curran's magic sentence, the most complex and rigorous statistical models are constrained by the extent to which we are truly measuring what we believe we are measuring. This means that if our repeated measures are not truly measuring the same thing over time, then we aren't purely studying growth over time. Put simply, you cannot accurately study change over time if you're not collecting data on the same thing over time. If you thought measuring exuberance longitudinally was complicated, buckle your seatbelt. Who here has a child in your life? Take a moment to think about where that child is in terms of literacy development and how you would assess that child's reading achievement where they are right now. If I were to survey the room and organize your answers based on how old the child is, what we'd see is that we would need different measurement instruments throughout childhood in order to capture where children are at that point. And that's because a developmentally appropriate measure in early childhood should have a ceiling effect by middle childhood. Reading achievement is a good example of how skills and behaviors that manifest differently as children develop can't be measured the same way across childhood. When a child is in preschool or kindergarten, an appropriate assessment involves asking the child to just identify letters and maybe some simple words. Regardless of how excellent an instrument might exist, it's not going to function properly once Reading achievement involves more than just identifying symbols. The meaning of child literacy changes and gains additional facets as children age. By first grade, children no longer just recognize words, they're writing sentences. In second grade, they're writing paragraphs. Reading comprehension is also developing, which involves understanding the meaning behind unfamiliar written passages and being able to answer questions about them. A letter word identification, like the one administered in kindergarten, simply can't capture other aspects of the construct which emerge throughout childhood. A background in psychometrics is not needed to understand that, although what constitutes reading achievement across childhood changes in a way which forces changes in how it can appropriately be measured, there's the same underlying phenomenon which motivates these changes. Progression of the same latent construct, this induces a double dose of measurement issues when trying to assess growth over time. At each measurement occasion throughout childhood, there are measurement issues posed specific to that age. And then there are these overall measurement issues when trying to string together those age-specific measurements to assess how the construct develops. This makes trying to model a growth curve for reading achievement from childhood to adolescence challenging because reading achievement has no inherent metric and the meaning of it changes throughout childhood such that the metric at any given measurement occasion can't be applied to all other measurement occasions with the expectation of capturing growth. Long story short, if you try to use the same measurement from childhood to adolescence to assess reading achievement, you will not be studying reading and development across childhood. You'll only be meaningfully studying it at the ages for which the assessment actually matches where the child is in terms of the construct. Measuring a latent construct like reading achievement at any point in childhood poses a slew of measurement issues. How can the researcher be sure that she is really measuring what's intended? 
did the instrument comprehensively measure all relevant aspects without contamination. It takes teams of psychometricians and content experts to develop an instrument associated with strong measurement properties. Achieving confidence in the validity of score interpretations at a single measurement occasion is by itself a big deal. This is exacerbated when we take things longitudinal, especially when the construct looks different across childhood. Which brings us to longitudinal measurement equivalents. There are different terms for longitudinal measurement equivalents in the literature. Although I'll try to be consistent in my language, you might also hear me refer to it as longitudinal measurement invariance because it's a rose with many names. And in my daily existence, I use the terms measurement equivalence and measurement invariance interchangeably. Who here has heard of differential item functioning, diff? If you're working or talking in an item response theory context, you're more likely to hear it referred to that way. Who here attended Professor Saperstein's Blaylock lecture first session? Studying racial and gender inequality, it matters how you measure. Professor Saperstein gave a great lecture in the context of survey data. I loved it when she said, you don't change the measure if you want to measure change. That is the logic behind longitudinal measurement equivalents in a nutshell. Longitudinal measurement equivalence means that the same latent construct is measured in the same metric at every measurement occasion across time. Achieving this is necessary if you want to be confident that any growth you observe is due to the latent construct progressing over time, not changes in how it was measured, which means that we need longitudinal measurement equivalence if we want to be confident that we're drawing meaningful substantive conclusions about growth and development. And this can become very challenging in cases like the one I just described where you can't use the same assessment over time. So let's start with a simpler case of longitudinal measurement. A friend and her husband are collecting longitudinal data on their infant. This is a screenshot from her husband's phone. He was showing me the app they use to track their baby's sleep weight patterns, that sort of thing. And then he got to the growth curves, at which point I requested a screenshot. And as you can see, he kindly complied despite being down to 11% battery. <laughs> Each time a child is taken to the pediatrician for a checkup, the child's height is plotted on a graph and the dots from each measurement occasion are connected to form what is called a growth curve. If simple precautions are taken to ensure consistency of measurement conditions, such as making sure the child is always shoeless and standing up straight, there should be no measurement issues when it comes to height. The unit of measurement, inches, means the same thing regardless of how much the child grows. There are equal intervals between each unit, and it's an objective form of measurement with no dependency in measurement. Assuming that the instrument is positioned and read correctly, it should not matter who is doing the measuring or what form of a ruler they use. A yardstick, a tape measure, a poster on the wall with tick marks. It shouldn't matter where the child is, how old the child is, or how tall the child is. The scale is applicable with the same meaning across the lifespan. This growth curve, which unequivocally measures the same thing over time, exemplifies the sort of measurement properties that are assumed by growth curve models. So, theoretically, if measuring growth using height, there should be no measurement issues. But even with an unambiguous form of measurement like height or weight, we can have longitudinal measurement issues if conditions are inconsistent. When my friend was pregnant with the baby that this growth curve belongs to, she was frustrated that to her doctors, it looked like she was gaining the perfect amount of weight with every appointment. But according to her scale at home, which she used daily, she was gaining the bare minimum amount of weight that's healthy during a pregnancy. She attributed it to her clothing because she wore heavier clothes with every appointment. She was frustrated that her doctor never took it into account that she became pregnant in the summer. And as the seasons progressed, her recorded weight went up more so to her attire than to her pregnancy. When she told me that story, I responded perhaps a little too excitedly with, that's measurement error. That's a longitudinal measurement issue. This is what I study. <laughs> We've established that weight is an unambiguous form of measurement. 
If we can have measurement issues when longitudinally measuring something easy like weight, imagine if we were measuring something longitudinal that has no set metric. Measuring phenomena for which there's no inherent scale poses a series of important measurement issues. Issues posed when you're trying to measure something with no natural metric are only exacerbated when it can't be measured the same way over time. So let's think more about reading achievement over time. Unlike the pediatrician's growth curve in which a one unit increase means the same amount of growth at any point across the lifespan, trying to model a growth curve for reading achievement presents challenges. This measurement issue is not unique to reading achievement. A major methodological issue in studying child development is that there's academic, behavioral, and socio-emotional aspects of development for which there is a single underlying latent construct that's growing over time, but that construct can't be measured the same way over time because it manifests differently as children develop. For example, aggression manifests differently throughout childhood. Biting is considered a developmentally appropriate vice in early childhood, but increasingly delinquent when we get to middle childhood, late childhood, and beyond. The same amount of biting is interpreted as much more problematic as children age, despite being identical in quantity. And biting is an unusual way for a teenager to express aggression. So if we were to try to measure developmental trajectories of aggression based on how many times a day someone bites someone, we would miss a lot of information because children who are aggressive are likely to be using different forms of aggression as they develop. Recording the number of biting incidents would fail to capture aggression at times when a more developmentally normative expression might involve verbal aggression or different forms of physical aggression. This dilemma is also not unique to studying children. As an example of how it is very relevant in other disciplines as well, I'll now show you an article on longitudinal measurement equivalence in political science research which expresses the same sentiment. Let's read the abstract. For over 50 years, the American National Election Studies ANES survey has been measuring citizens' evaluations of the trustworthiness of the government in Washington an indicator that has been widely used to monitor the dynamics of political trust in the US over time. A critical assumption in using attitudinal constructs for longitudinal research is that the meaning and interpretation of such items should be comparable across groups of respondents at any one point in time and across samples over time. This is just like what I just described in the context of children with the added component of worrying about measurement equivalence between groups. We test the measurement equivalence assumption with data collected by the ANES from 1964 to 2008. The results confirm that the ANES's political trust scale has the same basic factorial structure over time. But for two key items, several threshold parameters were found to be different across time points, indicating that the meaning and interpretation of these questions, and especially the question about whether the government in Washington wastes money that people pay in taxes, varies significantly over time. You've now seen an example in child development and in political science. These fields are different enough that hopefully you can see how these measurement issues have broader relevance in social, political, and behavioral sciences. Measurement issues need to be taken seriously in any field working with latent constructs because we all share an ultimate goal. Statistical models are a simplification. We are never going to be able to perfectly explain social phenomena. However, with methodological rigor, we can approach confidence and accuracy, or at least be precise enough that we feel like the model produces useful and justified inferences. Our ultimate goal in statistical modeling is to represent aspects of the social world and to produce meaningful inferences. Anything which compromises methodological rigor compromises reaching this ultimate goal. Ignoring the measurement equivalence assumption is one of the many ways researchers can inadvertently compromise methodological rigor. It's a validity issue if violations of measurement equivalence change research results from what they would have been to the extent that it leads to incorrect research conclusions. 
My two main examples today involve child development and political science. If you think about these fields and perhaps your field, your field may or may not be one that is used to inform policy and funding decisions. There are social consequences when research-based decisions are made based on research lacking methodological rigor. Research and child development is used to inform decisions regarding parenting and how children are educated. Imagine if interventions designed to support children's academic achievement were based on research that didn't even measure achievement properly. With that in mind, we can further unpack this power sentence, thinking about growth curve modeling. As mentioned with our hypothetical example, studying change over time requires repeated measures. Since longitudinal measurement equivalence is necessary to confidently attribute the growth that you observe to change in the latent construct itself, not changes in how it's measured over time, I see establishing longitudinal measurement equivalence as a precondition for all other statistical assumptions when doing growth curve modeling. Even if all other assumptions are tenable, if measurement is not equivalent across time, or at least partially equivalent, is there really longitudinal data to model? Growth curve models are useful for understanding how people develop and what predicts how people develop. But as with all statistical models, they are most useful when following the instructions in the user manual. <laughs> that user manual is your list of statistical assumptions. We know that checking statistical assumptions is a prerequisite for running an analysis because if assumptions are untenable, results might not be meaningful. Just as with other assumptions, meeting measurement equivalence is necessary if you want to confidently derive meaning. Repeated measures are an assumption implicit to growth curve modeling. Just like checking assumptions by running descriptives and plotting your data, are, I know all of you do it as standard practice before running a model, right? Always. Longitudinal measurement equivalence should be taken seriously as an assumption to be checked. However, I don't always see measurement equivalence treated with the respect that it merits as a prerequisite. That's why it's an implicit assumption. It is so inherent that somehow it gets overlooked because it sounds rather silly to try to run a growth curve model without measuring the same thing over time. There are two things that I would like to see become standard practice before running a growth curve model. One, if you have data on the item level, test for longitudinal measurement equivalence. Two, empirical growth plots to get an idea of the shape of growth. That is outside the scope of this presentation, but I'm measuring, mentioning it quickly because a quick spaghetti plot can save you a lot of heartache due to functional form misspecification. Since the precision of the growth curve model is contingent on meeting the assumption of longitudinal measurement equivalence, measurement non-equivalence poses a threat to the validity of research conclusions. After all, the most complex and rigorous statistical models are constrained by the extent to which we are truly measuring what we believe we are measuring. I'm trying to keep this talk less technical and more conceptual, but if you've been craving more details, here's a sample of a piece by Patrick Kern and Michael Willoughby that you might be interested in reading more of. It gets more technical in the piece itself, but this is a sample. In order to meaningfully interpret individual differences in stability and change in a particular construct across time, it is necessary to first establish that the construct itself is measured in the same way across time. If it is not, Individual differences in stability or change over time are equivocal because true change in the construct is inextricably confounded by differential changes in the measurement of the construct. This issue is particularly salient in trajectory modeling given the implicit assumption that our measure Y is constant over time and any mean or covariance structure differences are interpreted to reflect true change in the construct and not simply change in the psychometric measurement of the construct over time.
Modeling growth involves measurement issues both between and within measurement occasions. Issues of consistency between measurement occasions are yet another set of issues on top of the usual set of issues within measurement occasions. That's why I started by talking about measurement issues in general before bringing it into the longitudinal context. This becomes even more complex when we're working with a construct that doesn't manifest the same way at each measurement occasion. Although I use growth curve models as my main example, measurement equivalence is just as important in other longitudinal contexts. For example, in a pretest, post-test design, it's really important to make sure the same thing is measured at both times, otherwise, any treatment effect that you find can't be confidently attributed to the treatment. Although my focus here was on longitudinal measurement issues, no latent constructs are immune from measurement issues. Longitudinal measurement equivalence is a validity issue wrapped in a validity issue in that longitudinal measurement presents the separate set of issues that's on top of the regular ones that are present when studying latent constructs. Who here studies differences between groups, countries, cultures, etc., or has subpopulations in your data? Although I focused on longitudinal measurement equivalence, the same logic applies when you're trying to measure the same construct across groups of people. To make comparisons, it's important to first establish measurement equivalence to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. This is especially important with cross-country comparisons, since the questionnaires could be interpreted differently due to translation, cultural differences, etc. <laughs> if you are in Doug's structural equation modeling class, you will get the inside joke when I say, thank you, Microsoft. Or, even if you're not making comparisons, if you have subpopulations in your data, you may wish to test for measurement equivalence between groups just to make sure that you're studying the same thing across your sample. So, my takeaway point is, regardless of whether you are working with cross-sectional data or longitudinal data, whether you're doing a bivariate regression or a second-order latent growth curve model with time-varying covariates, if you are working with latent constructs, you must take measurement issues seriously if you want to have faith in the meaningfulness of your research conclusions. Questions? <laughs> Questions? Yes, oh, we have a special box microphone. And I, I do not throw microphones, but you are welcome to throw it to the next person with a question. Oh, you don't have to. You can just hold it like a talking stick. So let's say somebody's doing a longitudinal study over a period of 10, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years. Our understanding of whatever the construct is is mm -hmm. going to evolve and become more refined. And that may demand changes in the way we measure mm -hmm. the construct. By definition, you're going to have different, different measurements, mm -hmm. different measures of that construct. How do you address that? Yes, that is the million dollar question. In case you didn't hear, a um, great question was just posed, which is, if you have longitudinal data, you say over 10, 20, 30 years, Correct. and you can't measure it the same way over time because think times are changing, things are changing, measures are changing. What was the last part of your question? Yes, microphone? please, please. Yes, that's a microphone. Talk into it. <laughs> You're throwing me off now. You're okay. Um, the basic idea is that our understanding of the construct changes, mm -hmm. and the way we measure that construct yes. is going to evolve. So how do you address that based on everything you've had to say? Yes, here? that is a wonderful question, and I'm so glad you asked that. So how do you address that based on all of this? It very much depends on your individual context because there's no magic recipe. If you have data on the item level, if you're lucky enough to have data on the item level, you can do formal tests of measurement equivalence. It just so happened that Doug was started talking about those today in class. So if you have data on the item, which is coincidental and works out really well if you're in the structural equation modeling class. So if you have data on the item level, you can formally test for measurement equivalence. If not, 
there would be individual con considerations based on your individual context, whether you think that it's really measuring the same thing in the same metric over time. Cool, thanks. Other questions? You're going to come get this, right? I will come get it. I will come retrieve the, the talking stick. Great, thanks. Other questions? Yes. Oh. Sure. Sure. So, can you tell us more about how do you go about testing the equivalent between items? Yes. I am so glad you asked that. I was hoping someone would ask that because. This was a very conceptual presentation, which was meant more than anything to just open people's eyes to the idea that. This issue matters. And so I was really hoping someone would ask that. So on my slides, I have some recommended reading. The first part are resources for understanding measurement equivalence. In that, those are things that I would recommend reading to get a better handle on the topic. I thought about putting tutorials up there, but then I realized that there are such specific contexts that what I can, the best advice I can give in terms of tutorials is once you know what your context is, you might be able to find one. My advisor recently published a tutorial that was on how to test for measurement equivalents across groups with ordered categorical indicators. So these tutorials can get kind of specific. Up here I have references that teach you more about what measurement equivalence is and understanding what the different tests for it are. Down there I have, I found an article which seemed cool. As I'm sure you can tell, I'm not a political scientist. So I don't know if this is, is this a decent political science journal? Oh, good. So I thought this article was cool because it talks about an example in political science where they're going kind of in depth in how to test your measurement equivalents, both across groups and across time. That's why it's cross-national and longitudinal. The ones on top, I have a mix of both things that are appropriate for measurement equivalents across groups and measurement equivalents across time. The Roger Millsap one, Statistical Approaches to Measurement Invariance, that's a textbook that if you were stranded on a desert island and could only take one resource on measurement equivalents, that textbook would be okay. So these are some resources. And I'm so glad you asked that. I was hoping someone would. Other questions? Yes. So, if, like, back to that, like, main quote. Yes. That is such a thought-provoking question. I'm going to turn it to the audience. Who here has an example of that? Or something you could think of hypothetically that you're kind of suspicious of? John? And that's interesting and goes to your point that even if you're not doing a longitudinal model, if you're trying to just compare studies or look at the research over a body of years, is it really on the same thing?
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I appreciate that question. So I don't believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And it, water, I'm from New Jersey, sorry. Uh, so I don't believe in throwing out the past research, but I do believe in looking at it with a more critical eye and taking it with a grain of salt as needed because we don't want to throw out everything we have because that's all we have. But at the same time, we don't want to take things at face value because to me, caring about measurement issues is about not taking things at face value. So we, we want to use past research and past theory to inform our future research and inform our understanding of the world. But at the same time, we want to be cognizant of that measurement is really, really complicated. And we hope people are doing their best. And even when, they, and when they're not and when there are, we really want to look carefully and think through how things are measured. When I get a journal article in my hands, the first thing I, well, first I read the abstract. And then the, the next thing I do is I read the, the measures section because there are so many times when I read the measure section and I'm like, okay, this article has this variable name in the title. I don't see this actually described in any of the measures. So one thing I would do in terms of when reading the past research is to really pay attention to their methods section and read how they measured things and hopefully they have details. Sometimes they don't. I really appreciate those questions. Those are great. Did anyone else think of what, what is your name? What Maggie was just, was just describing in her first question, something where, well, how did you describe it? Yes, I bet there are more people here who can think of examples. Does anyone else have anything else in mind? John's example is great, but more examples would be even better. Yes, Chris, and then Mike. Thank you, Chris. Wow. Mike had his hand up. Mike is our longitudinal professor, so. Sam actually, thank you so much, Mike. And that really fits with what Maggie was saying. And Sam actually, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yesterday, do you feel like saying what you're saying about diabetes yesterday? Oh, is this similar to my story where the it cut off, basically cut off can change over time? And so it might look like you have so many more people who can diagnose with the disease, um, but it's just that the definition changed. Or an example from a survival analysis class is what happens when you have a better um, diagnostic test. So you're able to detect cancer earlier. It might look like survival for specific cancer is, is better. Um, but just because you 
Yes, thank you for letting me put you on the spot, Sam. Other questions or thoughts? Yes. That is such a great example, especially with those trendy pop culture findings that are like that, like people who have children are happier. And they don't actually say what they did to measure happiness. In my undergraduate child development class, when I have the day on research methods, I tell my students that one of my biggest pet peeves is when people start a sentence with research supports and then don't actually say what research where. I'm like, of course I want these data-driven arguments, but, but where did, how was that measured? Who studied it? Yes. Is that a hand or a stretch? Yeah, another, another example. Yes. Testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Experts say it's actually very difficult to measure. We make so many decisions on emissions based on yes. questionable findings. Yes. What is your name? Torbett. What? Torbett. Did I say it right? Good. What Torbett just said is actually something else that I do with my undergrads who are going to be future teachers and work. I work in a school of education. I'm in school at a school of education. So, yes. And one of the things I do with my undergraduates who want to be elementary school teachers and are going to be dealing with scores from IQ tests is I bring in an outdated copy of the WISC, which is um, an achievement test, and I read off the most difficult. I'm allowed to do just one item per each one. I read off the most difficult item in each and to give them an idea of what's actually being measured. And at the end of the day, they realize, wait, these are measuring school skills. This isn't measuring multiple intelligences. And that really goes to what you're saying in that how do we measure these things and make big decisions based on these things? Like what, whether a student gets put in a remedial class or an advanced placement class and all of that. These are big decisions based on sometimes arbitrary cutoffs.